this guy. <clears throat> like, if you could imagine one thing this guy's saying, what would it be? <laughs> don't, please, I don't, I don't know if I want to hear it out loud. <laughs> but in my mind, when I see this guy, I see him saying, get off my lawn. So I, I don't know if that's what came into your mind, but it's definitely um, what came into my mind. And probably since that's what I typed into the Google search engine, and this is what came up. You know, get off my lawn. But, you know, there's always that one guy in the neighborhood, right? That's the get off my lawn guy. Uh, we have one in our neighborhood, but since this goes on, you know, the internet, I'm just going to keep my mouth shut. So I'll just pretend like I'm that guy because there is one guy in our neighborhood that thinks I'm that guy. So we have this neighbor, and, you know, every day he's walking home from school, and for the longest time, he would walk through our yard because there's kind of a thoroughfare there, right? If you go behind the magic wand, you can go behind the orthodontist, and there's a break in the fence, and you can go straight through, straight through our property, right? So a lot of people walk that way. Well, anyway, this neighbor boy is walking that way one time, and, and I'm in the living room, and we have this big picture window, and I see him out there. And so I start knocking on the window. Like, you know, I'm just waving. Like, hey, dude, how you doing? But you can tell this guy's like, this guy wants me off his lawn. <laughs> so he, like, takes off across the yard. And then uh, I didn't think anything of it until, like, you know, the next couple of days I saw him take the long way all the way around. And I was like, I'm not get off my lawn guy now, at least to that poor kid. I was just trying to say hi, but I guess it came across uh, poorly. Right, girls are laughing because <clears throat> they know that guy. But there are people like that. They're like, you know, just, just get off my yard because stay away from my property. You know, don't encroach on my space because if you do, I'm going to get angry. So if we rewind back to when I was just like 10, 11 years old, you know, my dad, I don't know what possessed him to do this. He never had done anything like this before. But he came into the garage one day, and he says, you want me to build you a ramp for your bike? And I was like, yeah, that sounds good. And so he, bought, he built me this huge ramp that's like, it's like this tall, like this long. And so we would set it out in the middle of the street. You know, so I'm from suburbia, right? So we'd set it out in the middle of the street, and you know, we'd drive down as fast as we can, and we'd go up this ramp. The problem was we just, we just couldn't get enough speed to really get the jumps that we wanted. So we had this cul-de-sac across the street from our house. So you know, our house sat on a hill. We had a driveway that was really steep, then the road, and then this little tiny cul-de-sac that was just the width of one house. So there's one house on the left side, and there's one house on the right side, and then there was a cornfield. All right, so we had this great idea. Well, we'll put the ramp in the cul-de-sac. We will drive down the driveway cross the street and boom, launch into the sky. And so we did that for, for weeks, and it was glorious, right? But there's this old guy in the house over here, and he just kept coming out onto his porch whenever we would do it, kind of with his arms on his hips. And you could tell he just wanted to say, you, know, you need to stop that. You know, get, get this out of my yard, you know, pretty much. This is in front of my house. You could tell he was unpleased, displeased with it, but we didn't really care. So we just kept going and jumping. <laughs> then one day, he had his grandkids over. It was like a Sunday afternoon, and his grandkids were over, and his grandkid had this bike, and he might have been seven or eight years old, and he's like, this looks like fun. So his grandkid came up onto our driveway and went down, and he tried to do the jump, and it did not work so well, and he flew off of his bike, skinned up his arm, and I have never seen somebody so angry in my life. <laughs> that guy came running out, and he literally took the ramp, and he pulled it into pieces, and he says, if I ever see you anywhere near my property again, you're going to get it. And so we just ran back into my house, and we're like, I guess we'll stick to Nintendo for a while, right? <clears throat> but there's always that, that one guy, like, get off my lawn. This is my turf. This is my property. Not yours. You don't belong here. This is where I have authority. This is where I have domain, not you. And I would like to say, you know, that that's just out there. You know, we've probably met people in our workplaces. You know, that's my customer. You know, that's my person. You, you don't say anything to them. It's... You know, we've probably seen it in our families, probably seen it in our neighborhoods, where people, like, are very territorial about this or that. And I'd like to say it's just out there. It's just in the world. But it's not, is it? It's in the church, too. There is a lot of what I might call turf wars in the church. And we could get into this for hours and hours and hours if we so choose. But what we're going to look at today here in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 4, if you want to turn there, is we are going to look at basically a turf war, but one with very serious ramifications. <coughs> so I want to talk about a couple of old turf wars, you know, that were involved in the Christian faith. You know, I don't know if you've ever heard of a guy by the name of John Bunyan. 
So not Paul Bunyan, not the guy with the axe and the bull, but John Bunyan. You know, he's the guy who wrote A Pilgrim's Progress. He also wrote several other classic pieces of literature. But he didn't grow up as a Christian. It wasn't until he got married. You know, he had a, a wife that was a believer, and he wasn't a believer at the time. And so she decided that she was just going to leave little bits of Christian literature around for him to find. And he did. And he started to read these things. And he says, you know what? I need to be a Christian. And so he became a Christian. But he's a pretty marginal one. You know, he would go to church once in a while, but not really all that often. And didn't really ever, like, have any kind of personal relationship with God necessarily. So one day he was walking home and there was these four elderly ladies kind of standing in the middle of the road. And they were having a theological discussion. And they were talking about Jesus. And he stopped there for a second and he just was listening to him. And he just said, you know, I really enjoy listening to these people talk about God. He's like, maybe I need to go to church a little bit more. So he went over to these ladies and he said, what church do you go to? And so they told him what church that they went to. And so he says, we're going to leave the church that we are, we're at and we're going to go to this church because they actually talk about Jesus. And so they started to attend there and he started to grow in his faith. And he got to know the pastor there, a guy by the name of John Gifford, really became friends with him. And it was different than the church he was at before because he was at the Church of England, the Anglican Church, which in Massachusetts at that time, almost everything was run by the Anglicans. Everybody else was called separatist churches. So you were either part of the official church or you were part of a separatist church. It doesn't matter how different all these little separatist churches were, they were all just considered outside of what we are, what the official religion is. And, you know, John Bunyan didn't know any better. He didn't know that there was this turf war going on between one particular church and another particular church. All he knew about was the message of Jesus. And it was simple to him. You know, there is no other name under heaven by which somebody can be saved other than the name of Jesus. That's it. That's the only way to God. And he didn't just want to learn about it. He wanted to tell people about it. So he was one of those people that he would actually go out into the fields where people were working And he would like stand up on a tree stump and he would just start preaching to him about the name of Jesus. And just, he would do that everywhere. He would go into the middle of town and stand there and start telling people about Jesus. And that's different than the guy that you go to New York City and you see the guy on his literal soapbox yelling at you about what or not. You know, people try to avoid that person. That's not what John Bunyan was like. He was good at what he did. People loved to listen to him. And so he started to draw crowds. Like, not just people from his town, but people started coming from other towns, and people started coming from other states, just to hear John Bunyan get up on his stump and start telling people about Jesus. Okay, so you might think the church would go, this is a good thing. You know, there's people coming. There are people are hearing the good news about Jesus. That's great. You would think, but that's not how it went down. Okay, the first people to get angry, you know, were the, was the Church of England, because he was teaching separatist doctrine. He wasn't teaching Church of England doctrine. And it wasn't a big deal as long as he's just bothering people in the middle of a field. But now that people are starting to come from other states and people from even their own congregations are starting to go out and listen to him, now it's a big deal. Who does this guy think he is to teach our people? You know, this guy doesn't have the correct doctrine. We have the correct doctrine. And so they decided they were going to try to do whatever they could to shut John Bunyan down. Now, you might think he'd still have some friendly skies over there at the Separatist Church, you know, where he, you know, was attending. But no, they were equally as angry. Who are you? You've been a Christian for literally a year. What do you know? You don't have the right kind of education. You don't know what you're talking about. You just need to sit down and shut up. You know, let us do the preaching, not you. So John Bunyan was getting it from both sides. And it got to the point where they were able to get the local police to arrest him for preaching. And so they took him into jail and they said to him, they said, okay, If you will stop preaching, if you will apologize to these church leaders, let them do their thing and you go do your thing, we'll let you out of jail. If you don't, we're going to keep you in jail. So guess how long John Bunyan ended up in jail? Twelve years. Because he would not say, he would not just say, I'm not going to preach. He says, if you let me out, I'm going to preach. And so they said, all right, we're going to keep you in. And so it was during that 12-year period when he was in jail that he wrote A Pilgrim's Progress, and he wrote many of these other great literary works. So he got caught in the crossfire of a pretty serious religious turf war. And those are way too common, where church people care more about power, they care more about influence, than they actually care about leading people to the Lord. And we need to make sure, we're going to look at one right here today, and we need to see what we can learn from that. Here's another one, 300 years earlier. A guy 
by the name of John Wycliffe. Maybe you've heard that name. You know, he was one of the first people to translate the Bible into English. So all, most of the copies of the Bible at that particular time were in Latin, which is the way that the Roman church liked it because they understood Latin and most other people did not. Okay? So John Wycliffe comes along and you know, he had some radical ideas like, hey, maybe people should be able to read the Bible on their own. Wouldn't that be great if they could just open it up at home and, and read? Let's do that. Let's translate the Bible into the common ordinary language. And the Roman church was extremely upset. Why? Because they don't want people reading the Bible on their own. What do they know? They're not going to be able to interpret it correctly. They're going to come to all sorts of terrible conclusions. They just need to trust us and what we tell them. And so they, tr they tried to stop translators in Germany, England, you name it. They were trying to stop people from translating the Bible into the ordinary language. But that's why the printing press ended up kind of bringing about the Reformation. It's because people began to get Bibles in their own language in their hands. And yeah, they were right. It did start to diminish the power of the Roman church. Okay, so they, they were kind of right that this was going to be a problem for them because their issue was not we want people to know about Jesus. Their issue was we want to continue to be the sole source of authority here. This is our turf. You know, get off my lawn, John Wycliffe. So what did they end up doing to him? Well, he continued to translate the Bible. And so they ended up arresting him as well. And they were going to put him on trial. The unfortunate part for them is that he ended up dying you know, before they were able to put him on trial. So you would think that would be the end of the story, but it didn't stop there. They put him on trial anyway. They convicted him of heresy. They dug up his body. They burned it. And then they poured it into the river. Just, I guess, to be vindictive. This is our turf. Don't you dare step on it. You get off my lawn. So you got guys like John Bunyan and, and John Wycliffe who didn't bow down when somebody said, hey, we're the authority here. We're the ones that have jurisdiction. You need to keep your mouth shut. They believed that there's only one name under heaven by which mankind can be saved, and that is in the name of Jesus. And they were going to do whatever they could to let people know about Jesus. As simple as that. Jesus is the only way to God. It's the only way to eternal life. How can I keep that bottled up? I need to tell as many people about it as I possibly can. And that got them into some huge trouble. And Jesus said this would happen. I, I think I have a passage of scripture up here. <clears throat> so these are predictions of Jesus. And when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not become anxious about how or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and will persecute you, delivering you to synagogues and prisons, bringing you before kings and governors for my name's sake. And it will lead to an opportunity for your testimony. So make up your minds not to prepare beforehand to defend yourselves, for I will give you the utterance and wisdom which none of your opponents will be able to resist or refute. So Jesus said that this was going to happen when they started going out and teaching about the name of Jesus. And we're going to see in our passage this morning that it did indeed happen. So what can we learn from this? Now, the main thing I want to focus on here today is that Jesus is the only name that saves. Jesus is the only name that saves. And if that's true, if Jesus' name is the only name that saves, then shouldn't we tell people about it? Shouldn't that be our goal? Our goal shouldn't be to amass political power. You know, our goal shouldn't be to shut people down who are legitimately preaching the gospel. Our goal should be to love people and show them the gospel and share with them the gospel in any way we can and every way we can. And when people try to shut us down, we'll keep doing it anyway. And that's what we see here exemplified in Peter and John. That's what we saw exemplified in John Bunyan. That's what we got, saw exemplified in John Wycliffe. You know, they stood up to these people who were saying, get off my lawn. And they said, hey, we just want to share the good news that there is no other name under heaven by which mankind can be saved other than the name of Jesus. So let's take a look here in Acts chapter 4. So this is at the beginning of the early church. Okay. Pentecost was just a couple of chapters before this. So that was literally kind of the beginning of the church. And so the church just keeps growing and growing and growing. So as these early apostles are starting to tell people about Jesus and his death and his resurrection, people are coming to know the Lord. And, you know, we're going to see that happen here in this, these verses as well. So let's look here at the first four verses of chapter 4. <coughs> So while Peter and John were speaking to the people, the priests and the commander of the temple of God and the Sadducees came up to them, angry because they were teaching the people and announcing in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. So they seized them and they put them in jail until the next day, for it was already evening. 
But many of those who had listened to the message believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. Okay, so to understand this, we need to understand Jewish jurisprudence here for a second. You know, so what was it like? So Rome was in control. Rome kind of ran the nation at this particular moment. They had taken it over, you know, about 90 to 100 years earlier than this. But Rome didn't really care about just governing the day-to-day affairs in Judea and Jerusalem. It wasn't high on their priority list. They wanted their tax dollars, that's for sure. But they didn't really want to get involved in all the nuts and bolts. So they had ultimate authority, but they delegated a lot of it to this body in Jerusalem by the name of the Sanhedrin. So the Sanhedrin had a majority of the power. Now, Rome could come in and overrule, just like we saw with Pilate, you know, at the end of Jesus' life. But for the most part, you know, they allowed uh, the Sanhedrin to kind of run things how they saw fit. And the Sanhedrin was the executive branch, the legislative branch, and the judicial branch all rolled into one. So you had two executives. You had the, the high priests. And at this particular point, there was a lot of nepotism. So there was a guy by the name of Annas, and I don't know if you remember, I was talking about him last year, but... You know, Annas uh, was the high priest for a long time. And then he was able to finagle away during his lifetime for his son-in-law and four of his sons to also become high priest. That's a pretty powerful individual. And even though we see Caiaphas here in these stories, Caiaphas is the high priest who was the son-in-law to Annas, the real power behind the scenes is always Annas. He's the guy kind of running the show. So you've got these hugely powerful executives. You also had the, the, the captain of the temple guard, you know, the Chief of police was also part of the Sanhedrin. So you got some powerful executives there. You also, they're the ones that make the law. They're the legislative body. They deliberate and say, this is the new law that we're going to make that everybody must follow. They're also the judicial branch. So if you decide to break one of their laws, they're going to bring you in front of them and they're going to accuse you. And they have the ability to uh, give out punishments as well. They weren't allowed to kill anybody, but they were allowed to pretty much do anything else but that. So this is a hugely powerful body of human beings. Right? Extremely powerful body of human beings. And what do we see? We see that Peter and John find themselves in their crosshairs. So what happened? So Peter and John are just going to the temple one day, and there's a guy sitting outside, and he can't walk. He's been lame for a lot of his life. And so Peter and John say, I've got something good for you. You know, get up. So he gets up, and he's completely healed and starts walking around. In fact, we're told that later in this trial that they undergo, the guy's there just walking around. They healed him, literally healed the guy both inside and outside, spiritually and physically. It's a pretty amazing thing. And there are a lot of people that started taking note. Okay, so Peter and John were continually going to the temple and they were preaching about Jesus, how Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. He's come here, he's given his life, was resurrected three days later. We can have a right relationship with God through him. They're preaching this in the temple courts. They're doing these miraculous signs like, you know, getting this guy up and having him walk around. It's pretty good. And so that's why these people are starting to say this group of people, these early Christians, they're gaining way too much power. We must put a stop to this. And so they arrest Peter and John. Now, they can't put them on trial. It's late night. Hey, you got to sleep, right? So they put them into jail overnight and they're going to have the trial in the morning. And so that's what we read about here next as we read about the trial. So let's look here. <clears throat> you also notice that the size of the church is continuing to grow. You know, that 5,000 men had come to believe. You know, 5,000 men, I mean, let's say there's a woman for every man, and let's say two kids. You know, you can do the math there. That's like 20,000 Christians at least. Okay, maybe even more than that. So just imagine that you're running this temple establishment, and you've been teaching these people a certain thing for a long time, and all of a sudden this new group has come in, and they're teaching that the Messiah has come, and, and they're, they're stealing your people. Okay? You, you know, you're, you're on my lawn now. You're on my territory. You're taking my people. And so they didn't take too kindly to that, so they arrested them. So let's read about the trial the next day. On the next day, the rulers and elders and experts in the law came together in Jerusalem, and Annas the high priest was there. So, no, so notice they even just call Annas the high priest. He wasn't the high priest, it was Caiaphas. Annas the high priest was there, and Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others who were members of the high priest's family. After making Peter and John stand in their midst, they began to inquire, By what power or by what name do you do this? And then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, replied, Rulers of the people and elders, If we are being examined today for a good deed done to a sick man... 
By what means was this man healed? Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that it was by the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, whom you've crucified, whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you now healthy. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders that has become, and has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation found in no one else, for there is no name under heaven given among people by which man must be saved. No other name. So we have a trial here. You know, Peter and John are brought before this very powerful group of people. And so let's think about Peter here for a second. If we look back at the last few chapters of the Gospels, Peter is standing around a fire and a little girl comes up to him and says, aren't you one of those Jesus people? Weren't you in with this guy? And what does Peter say? Oh, no, 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 not me. You got me confused with somebody else. So we would say that that's a little weak need, right? We don't see that Peter here, do we? You know, Peter is looking at the Sanhedrin, the most powerful political body that he knows of in his immediate area. And he's looking him right in the eye and he's saying, what did I do wrong? I helped a guy. I shared with him the good news about Jesus. Why are you putting me on trial? And so he's standing up to this extremely powerful body of politicians. So they ask him, you know, by whose name are you doing these things? Okay, so basically this is the turf war, right? They're not, like, asking an honest question. It's not like they're sitting at the table saying, hey, just, you know, mano a mano here. You know, tell me a little bit about what you believe. You know, tell me whose authority you're doing this with. You know, who are you representing? This is adversarial. This is, you are on my turf. You guys are doing things you have no authority to do. So who gave you this authority is basically the question. By whose name are you doing this? Because we're the ones that give authority. We have not given you such authority. So you guys need to keep your mouth shut. That's basically what the Sanhedrin is trying to say to them. But what did Peter see? Peter sees this as an opportunity to talk to people about the name of Jesus. And that's exactly what he does, is he uses this as an opportunity to talk about the death and the resurrection of Jesus and how there is no other name under heaven by which mankind can be saved. And so Peter cuts right to the heart of it. He says, why are you, why are you putting me on trial? You know, we healed a guy? You know, we were telling people about Jesus? Are these bad things? And it wasn't because of our power that they were healed. It wasn't by our name that he did this. It was by the name of Jesus. The powerful name of Jesus is what healed this man. That's why he stands here before you today. Jesus, the Messiah that we've been waiting for. Okay, so this has got to really start sticking them in the side here, like poke, right? You guys have been waiting for a Messiah. Here he is. And you missed him. Not only did you miss that the Messiah was right amongst you, You nailed him to a cross. You guys did it. This political body, not even just a couple of months ago, you did it. You nailed him to the cross. You missed God and human flesh. It's pretty bold. You know, Peter's no longer cowering behind the fire. Peter is telling the most powerful people that he knows that Jesus is the only name that saves, and they stood against him rather than for him. And since they stood against Jesus rather than for Jesus, they stood against God rather than for God, because they cared more about their political power and influence than they cared about following Scripture, that they cared about following the will of God. And so he talks here, he quotes a psalm from Psalm 118, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. What does that mean? So when you build a building in the ancient world, you had to have a huge cornerstone that you would use, and we have cornerstones today too, but you'd have a a cornerstone that you could set and then you would build everything off of that. Okay. It could also be a reference to the capstone. So if you build an arch, you know, say you're building an arch, there's always got to be that one stone in the middle that kind of brings the arch together. So you get this picture you know, that the builders are going stone to stone. No, that's not it. No, that's not it. So they're looking for the perfect cornerstone, but they keep rejecting stones until they finally find one that they think is correct. And so Peter is saying the stone that the builders rejected has become the most important stone, has become the cornerstone, has become the capstone. You saw Jesus with your own eyes. You saw God's Messiah with your own eyes, and you rejected him. But this isn't the end of his story, because he was resurrected, and he was exalted to the right hand of God, and one day he's going to return, and every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. You rejected God's own son. You know, Jesus tells a parable, and he, he also quotes Psalm 118 here, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. 
So I think it's a very interesting parable when we're talking about this text. All right, so here's what happens. Jesus is telling this story, and he's telling it to the Jewish religious leaders. And he's referencing a passage from the Old Testament from the book of Isaiah chapter 5. And in Isaiah chapter 5, we're, we're told a story about God and his vineyard. So God is the vineyard owner, and the vineyard is Israel, his people. And God does everything he can to take care of the vineyard. You know, he, you know, he gets the land ready. He removes all the stones. He buys the choicest vines. He builds a, a fence to keep out wild animals. He builds a wine press so that when there's grapes that come, he can make wine. So he does everything he can to set his vineyard up for success. But instead, the vineyard is unsuccessful. So that's the parable from Isaiah. Well, Jesus adds to it. Jesus says, okay, well, God, you know, the vineyard owner goes away on a trip. And he decides to hire some tenant farmers. You know, you get that. We do that around here all the time, right? Where you have a bunch of land that's just sitting there. And so you decide, I'm going to make a little bit of money off of it. I'll call you know, the farmer down the street, and he can farm on my land, and he'll give me a little bit of money for it, some rent. We'll call it good. It's exactly what we're talking about here. So God says, I'm going to put other people in charge of my land, and I expect them to produce a good crop, and, you know, when that crop is harvested, I expect them to give me a percentage of it. Makes sense. So the vineyard owner goes away. He leaves the vineyard underneath the control of these tenant farmers. And so you can start to see this picture unfold, right? The vineyard is the people of God, the tenant owners are the Jewish religious leaders, these, this very Sanhedrin that we're talking about. And they're supposed to be caring for the people and leading them closer to God. But they don't care about that anymore. And so one day the owner sends a messenger to the farm saying, all right, it's harvest time. You guys owe us 10% of your harvest. Where is it? And so what do the tenant farmers do? Oh, thank you so much for the, for the opportunity to rent this land you know, yes, we've produced a good harvest. You know, here's your percentage of it. Thank you so much. No, what they do is they beat the guy up. And they say, get out of here and don't ever come back. And so this beaten up servant goes back to the master and he's like, I don't have anything for you. And so what does the owner do? He sends another. And then he sends another. And then he sends a whole group of people. And then he sends another group of people. And every time that they go, they get beat up. They get thrown out. Sometimes they even get killed. And so finally, the owner says, well, I'll send my son. Surely they will listen to my son. My son is the heir of the land. And so the son goes to the land, and he looks at the tenant farmers, and he says, hey, you owe, you owe the owner you know, this percentage of the crop. We, we need to collect it. And so what do they do to the son? They beat him up, and they kill him. And then Jesus says, the stone that the builders rejected will become the cornerstone. So what he's talking about himself there. He's saying, yeah, you guys have rejected me, but this isn't the end of my story. Yeah, you guys are going to nail me to the cross, but that's not the end of my story. The end of his story is resurrection and exaltation and that he will be king forever and ever. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The name of Jesus has become synonymous with salvation itself because no one can find salvation other than through him. All right, so Peter and John, <coughs> they tell them that. They said, this Jesus, this, this representative of God, God's stone, you rejected. But he's going to become the most powerful stone that ever existed, the, the most powerful human that ever existed because he came and sacrificed himself for the sins of the world. So let's see what happens next. Look at verse 13. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and discovered that they were uneducated and ordinary, they were amazed and recognized that these men had been with Jesus. And because they saw the man who had been healing standing with them, they had nothing to say against this. But when they had ordered them to go outside the council, they began to confer with one another, saying, What should we do with these men? For it's plain to all who live in Jerusalem that a notable miraculous sign has come about through them, and we can't deny it. But to keep this matter from spreading any further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So let's talk about their deliberations. What are some of the conclusions that they come to? And I think this is pretty amazing. The first conclusion is they just are, they're impressed. You know, against their better judgment, they're impressed that Peter was able to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with them. And it just kind of shows you how they thought of themselves. We are the elites. You know, we are the ones who know things. I can't believe that this uneducated fisherman, businessman from another, you know, the rural places up there in Galilee, I can't believe that he knows anything let alone being able to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with us. 
So you can already see the elitism there. But again, they're kind of grudgingly impressed. Yeah, they, yeah he was able to be well-spoken. He was able to represent himself well. So that's the first thing that they note. The second thing that they note is that their healing actually worked, right? It wasn't like it was some sort of, you know, smoke and mirrors. The guy was literally standing there next to them. The same guy that they had seen going in and out of the temple courts for years, begging for money at the gate. And here he is just standing there. So apparently this was a real miraculous sign. You don't see them try to deny it. You don't see them try to lie about it. You don't see them trying to say this was fake. What do you see them do? Yeah, they really did heal that guy. That's pretty amazing. But their next thought should have been what? Their next thought should have at least been, well, if they can heal somebody, maybe there's something to their claim. That was not their next thought, was it? People are going to believe them, and people are going to start to follow them rather than us. We need to shut them down. That's what their next thought was. And so you can see that they were not interested in, in what God was trying to say. They were not interested in accurately representing him. They were not interested in finding their Messiah. What they were interested in was power, political power. And we can see it evidenced by how they treat um, Peter and John here. But you know what? If you start killing people that everybody finds popular and imprisoning them because they healed a guy, that's not going to be a good public relations thing. So what they decide to do is to tell them, don't preach about Jesus again, and you can leave. Just keep your mouth shut. This is our turf. Get off our lawn. Don't you say anything about the name of Jesus, and we will leave you alone. And I think what might be going on here is, you know, we do that today, right? So say you're driving down 69, and uh, you're late for something, and you're going maybe 85 miles an hour. Right? And the cop, all of a sudden you look in the back and there's the sirens going off and you got to pull over. And the cop comes over and knocks on your window. You know how fast you're going, sir? Oh, I had to be going 70. No, you're going 85. All right. And then he looks at your record and, and you've been clean. You've been driving for 20 years, never had a ticket. So what's the cop going to do? Okay, most of the time he's probably going to say, hey, you need to slow down, buddy. And maybe write you a written warning, but he's probably not going to give you a ticket. Now, what if he looks on the little screen there and says that you've had four moving violations in the past four months? Then what's he going to do? He's probably not only going to give you a ticket, he might take you down to the station as well, right? Okay, so there's a difference between somebody that made a mistake, somebody might not have known what the speed limit was, and somebody who has been doing this over and over and over again. And so I think this is the first time, and so the Sanhedrin's like, all right, well, maybe we can just control them with words. Hey, if you do this again... You know, you're going to be right back here and things aren't going to go as well. And so they let them go once. They thought that this is the better of two evils, right? Because, you know, they allow them to go, but they're not going to speak about it anymore because they've grown wise now. They know what the consequences are going to be. <laughs> but before they even get it out of their mouth, let's look what Peter says. Look at verse 18. <clears throat> and they called them in and ordered them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. That's verse 18. And then verse 19, but Peter and John replied, whether it is right before God to obey you rather than God, you decide. For it is impossible for us not to speak about what we've seen and heard. And after threatening them further, they released them, for they could not find out how to punish them on account of the people, because they were all praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this miraculous sign of healing had been performed was over 40 years old. They don't even wait a day. They don't even wait a week. They just say, we're not going to listen to you. You know, we can't help but tell people about Jesus because there is no other name under heaven by which anybody can be saved other than the name of Jesus. We're not going to stay silent. All right, so let's think about this again. You know, you have this elite group of religious leaders, political leaders. They're looking down their nose at this uneducated Galilean fisherman. He doesn't know anything. And then what does Peter do? He quotes Socrates. He quotes a Greek philosopher. He says, which is it better for me to obey you or to obey God? Okay, that's a direct quote from Socrates when he stood before the Athenians. So here's this uneducated guy, and he's, he's pulling out Socrates' quotes in order to prove his point. But the idea is, okay, you're telling me to keep my mouth shut because this is your turf. You're telling me to get off your lawn. But Jesus, before he left, he told me that we're to take the message from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the outermost reaches of the earth because there's no other name under heaven by which mankind can be saved other than the name of Jesus. Who would you listen to? Would you listen to you or would you listen to God? We're going to listen to God. And so 
He does, they, don't, they haven't even got out yet. They haven't even got out of trial yet. And Peter's already saying, we're not going to follow your advice. We're not going to do what you told us to do because what you say is in direct contrast to what God wants us to do. We want people to know about God. So how's that you know, for uneducated morons, right? So the Sanhedrin listens to all this, threatens them some more, uh, but ends up letting them go. Because just like with Jesus, they were afraid of the crowds because the crowds were clearly intrigued by them. They're intrigued by this miracle that they were able to perform. And so it would have been you know, politically hard for them to do anything more than what they did, at least at this point. So what can we learn from this? <coughs> Simple. The name of Jesus is the only name. He's the only pathway to salvation, period, end of story. And if that's true, and that's something that we really believe, and if you believe in the Bible, that's something that we should believe, we should tell other people about it. We should care enough to share that good news with them, that Jesus is the only way. So I don't know if you remember Raiders of the Lost Ark, but earlier on in the, in the movie, you know, Indiana Jones talks about snakes, how much he likes snakes, well, or better put, how much he does not like snakes. And so if you've ever watched another movie in your whole life, you know what's coming, right? They're, they're going to put snakes in his road at some point. And sure enough, you know, he finds this place called the Well of Souls where he thinks there's information there about where the Ark of the Covenant is. And so they move this stone and he looks down into this hole. And what's down there? Snakes. Lots of snakes. Not just one snake or two snakes, but the whole floor is covered with snakes. And you can see Indiana try to like think through it in his mind, is there another way to do this? And finally, he's got to admit... The only way to do this is through. The only way through this is to, you know, deal with these snakes. It's the only way. And that's exactly what Peter and John are trying to tell you. There's only one way. There's only one way to God, and that's through the death and resurrection of Jesus. There is no detour. You can't find a workaround. The only way to God is through the death and resurrection of Jesus. So we live in a time period where I think we got two different groups of people. And uh, in the church. And you know, one group of people, they think, you know, we just need to make people be Christian. You know, we just can't allow other religions to exist. We, we don't want to tolerate them at all. And so they kind of become very adversarial. Rather than trying to persuade people about the good news of Jesus, um, they just kind of want to use their power or authority to kind of force it to be a certain way. That's not what Peter and John do. You have other people that I think cross over the line into maybe what we could call a spiritual ambivalence. Meaning that, you know, somebody believes that religion and somebody believes this other religion and somebody believes this third religion. That's okay. You know, as, as long as they believe in something, you know, we're good to go. As long as it's making them a good person, as long as it's making them more loving, then so be it. But they're confusing. You know, what's the point of Christianity? Is the point, and both of them, I think, got this wrong. Is the point of Christianity to make people more moral? And the answer to that is no. Now, will people, if they have a living, breathing relationship with the Son of God and with the Spirit of God who lives in our hearts, will they hopefully become more moral and more loving? Yes. Is that our goal? And the goal is no. We want to tell people about the work of Jesus and how they can be made right with the God of the universe because Jesus stepped into human history and gave himself for them. And so if we know this, if we know that Jesus is the only way then we should be trying to persuade people, you know, showing them the love of God by how we treat them and sharing the love of God by what we say to them. And this isn't just Peter and John here. You know, Peter and John said there's no other name under heaven by which mankind can be saved other than the name of Jesus. Jesus said in himself, you know, Jesus said in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. He doesn't say, I am a way, and a truth and a life, I am the way. And that's a pretty exclusive claim. You know, and it's a claim that you either have to accept or reject. There's not like four or five different ways to God. And you can just choose your, pick your own adventure, but you know, we'll all end up at the same end. I mean, you can believe that, but that's not what the Bible teaches. It's not what Jesus taught about himself. And that is not what Paul taught or Peter or James or John taught either. So let's talk about three different views of Jesus here. Okay, so let's talk about Discovery Channel Jesus. Okay, so if you've ever, you know, popped on the Discovery Channel and, you know, this time of year they love to do big Easter specials, so I'm sure you could find one today. And, you know, it'll tell you about the, the historical Jesus. And usually this is the train of thought. You know, Jesus was a real person 
You know, there's not very many scholars out there that would deny that Jesus is a real person. Because if you deny the historicity of Jesus, you pretty much got to deny ancient history at all. Because we have as much information about Jesus as we do about any other historical fact. Okay, so pretty much everybody agrees, yes, there was a historical Jesus. But the Jesus of the Discovery Channel is a nice guy. Kind of a political revolutionary, though, that had a lot of anti-authoritarian ideas. And he liked to go around telling people that it's okay to be anti-authoritarian. And he liked to question the status quo. But that after his death, he had some followers who got a little overzealous and deified him, turned him into something he never intended to be, and made him into this, uh, you know, this religious figure that he was never supposed to be. Because so that's Discovery Channel Jesus. Okay, then you got another view of Jesus out there that raises him up a little bit more. Maybe we could call this Gandhi Jesus. Okay, so, so Gandhi Jesus is, yeah, he was a real historical person, and he had a lot of spiritual insight. He knew the world. He knew human nature. You know, he knew how to make people better people, and he went around teaching that, and the people that followed his teachings were better off. So this is Gandhi Jesus. So just like Gandhi or Muhammad or Buddha or Confucius or whatever, you know, sort of person like that there's out there, Jesus was just one amongst many of those, just an enlightened spiritual figure. Okay, that had good things to say. But Discovery Channel Jesus, Gandhi Jesus, they're just not the Jesus that the Bible teaches. They're just not the Jesus that Jesus was. I mean, if you read Jesus' words, yeah, you know, he challenged the status quo, of course. Yeah, he had a lot of enlightened spiritual teaching and he wanted people to be more loving and good. I mean, just look at the Sermon on the Mount. But ultimately, Jesus had pretty exclusive things to say about himself that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. So if the Bible is true, and what Jesus says about himself is true, and if what Peter and John are saying about Jesus is true in this passage of Scripture, then anything less than believing what Jesus says about himself is going to fall short of really knowing God and having a relationship with God and looking forward to eternal life. So these words, I mean, no other name under heaven by which mankind can be saved. They put us in a situation where, like it or not, you're going to have to choose. You're going to have to choose whether you really believe this or not. You're going to have to choose to continue on your journey with Jesus or reject him completely. There's no in-between. There's no Discovery Channel Jesus. Yeah, I, I kind of like this Christianity thing. You know, I, was, I typed in Jesus' approval rating. I just wanted to see what his approval rating was. It is pretty interesting. Jesus' approval rating is like 92%. Everybody likes Jesus, right? The question is, what version of Jesus do they like? You know, do they like the biblical version of Jesus? You know, I think the church, I looked up the church approval rating too, and I think it was like 18%. So there's a little bit of approval rating difference between Jesus and the church. You know, people like Jesus, but we need to, we need to use that to persuade them. You know, that Jesus is not the Discovery Channel Jesus, who is just this anti-authoritarian guy who just liked to go around and, and yell at the people in power. He did do that. There's more than that. Nor is he just some enlightened spiritual figure, you know, that taught really good things that people should live by. He is God in flesh. He saw a problem, and that was that humankind were sinners. They inherited the sin of Adam. And because of it, they are estranged from a holy God. And God could have wiped his hands of us and said, we're just going to forget humanity. Maybe we'll just wipe them out and start fresh. Instead, Jesus himself decided to step into human history, to live in a world of poverty where he did not have to live in, a world of suffering where he could have stayed in the throne room of God with no suffering. But he decided to empty himself and to give up those things for you and for me. And so we might sit here and we might say, man, it's really an exclusive message that Jesus is the only way. But let's think about it from the other side. There's a way. God provided us a way. Not because we deserved it, not because we earned it, but because he loved us. He wanted us to be forgiven of sins. He wanted us to have a relationship with him. And so Jesus stepped into human history, willingly submitted to suffering. He even submitted to his own death a criminal's death on a cross for you and I so that he could take our sins on his shoulders so that he could defeat sin once and for all and that any of us who believe in him can defeat sin once and for all and have a relationship with God. And three days later, he rose from the grave, breaking the bonds of death so that we know that when we believe in him, not only do we defeat sin, but one day 
we will defeat death, and we will be with the Lord forever. There is no other name under heaven by which mankind can be saved other than the name of Jesus. You know, 1 Timothy 2, 5, and 6. I mean, we've got Peter's opinion. We've got John's opinion. We've got Jesus' opinion. Let's throw Paul's in there. There is only one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. Only one way. You know, Dr. Brand, you know, he's a famous theologian. And he told a story about his mother. His mother was a missionary to India. And it got to the point where she was 75 years old and she would travel around on a mule and she would go or she would walk from town to town and tell people all across southern India about Jesus. Well, one day she was walking to a nearby village and she fell down and she broke her hip. And she couldn't move. And it was actually two days before, you know, some people found her. And all they had was this cart pulled by this horse and there's no, like, paved road or anything. So they put her up into this... uh, the back of this cart and they just kind of went 150 miles to the nearest hospital so just imagine all those bumps you know on that road and of course she got to the hospital and the doctor took you know one look at it and she he said she's never going to be the same again this is not going to heal properly she's not going to walk again so dr brand took off to india and he got to his mom's hut and there she is and she's like got these bamboo crutches and she's trying to walk and she can't barely move at all and so Dr. Brand said to her, isn't it time? Isn't it time to retire? And why don't you come back to the States? You know, it will you know, get you a nice little house. And it, it's just time to retire. And she says, it's not time to retire yet. As long as this body exists and I can do anything with it, I'm going to use it for the name of Jesus. And so she kept on working. She would ride donkeys to villages and she would preach about Jesus. And she would have people pull her off the donkey and put her back on as she went back to on her way home. She did this for 18 years until she was 93. At 93, she couldn't stay on the donkey anymore without falling off. So she wasn't able to go anywhere. So Dr. Brand, again, he went to India and he had, tried to have a conversation with her. Mom, you're 93 years old. It's okay to take a break. Why don't you come on home and retire? Nope, not going to do it. And so she had people from her church. They literally like made hammocks that they would carry her in. And they would carry her from village to village. And she would continue to tell people about the name of Jesus. I mean, if that's not the spirit of Peter and John, I don't know what is. If that's not the spirit of John Wycliffe, you know, or John Bunyan, you know, these people, you know, who, even though others were saying, you know, you need to keep your mouth shut, you need to stop talking about this, they continued to preach about Jesus because there's no other name under heaven by which mankind can be saved other than the name of Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Lord, again, we thank you that you stepped into human history and that you gave yourself for our sin, not sin you committed, but sin that we committed. We thank you that by believing in you and repenting of our sins, that we look forward to a whole relationship with you, that we look forward to an eternity with you. And we can't thank you enough for that, that you provided a way of salvation. And Lord, we just pray that as we live our lives in this light of this great truth, that we kind of can embody the spirit of Peter and John that we can tell the people that we know and love and that are around us about the love of God too, shown through the work of Jesus, his death and his resurrection. We pray that in your wonderful name. Amen.